So now we are share some about the uh, liquid cooling solutions on the OI reference systems. Uh, I'm Richard Dean. I'm uh, the ASS Max Tech from Baidu. I'm um, Tian Yi. Yes. <laughs> I'm Tian Yi Gao, a thermal engineer at Baidu. <coughs> Yeah, this is the uh, uh, agenda for this topic. Uh, so first we are uh, share the current thermal challenges for the air hardware systems. Then we we, we share the example how uh, Baidu X-Men, the fourth generation uh, computer X-Men, solve this kind of challenges and other OEI reference systems. And see, so we, we, from the, our current experience, we see how we can uh, we can uh, make kind of standard that can serve the thermal uh, the thermal challenge is both uh, the liquid cooling and the air cooling uh, perspectives. And last, we share some uh, um, practice uh, how uh, REC and the data center facilities that can help to build the liquid cooling solutions. Yeah, okay, the thermal, yeah, um, to, to have a better performance for the AI computing, right? So generally, we need to increase the power consumption of the AI aggregators. So that can have a, uh, very, um, uh, for example, the uh, from the gen last generations, uh, the uh, for example, the GPU, right? So the power consumption uh, increased uh, um, from um, 250 watts and to 300 watts and even higher. So, so even now, 45, 40, 40, 40, 40 watts, right? And accordingly, they achieve the the performance benefits. So this is a very uh, general way how we can get the performance benefit. But this uh, has a lot of uh, uh, to solve the power, power uh, is a uh, very challenging. So, so for example, currently the the TPU, yeah, the V3, the third generation, yeah, adopt the liquid cooling to solve this kind of high density, high power AI accelerators. So, yeah, and uh, also we uh, share our OI references on how Baidu X-Men uh, solve this kind of thermal challenges. So we have uh, already uh, uh, three generations. So we our first generation in the launched in the middle of uh, 2016. At that time, we can support uh, 16. Uh, at, at that time, it's still GPU, right? So 16 GPU in one box. Um, basically, uh, at that time, the most uh, most typical GPU server support four, and at most eight GPUs in, in one in one chassis. So we can achieve 16. So you can see this in, in this chassis, all are GPUs. There's nothing else, right? And also we have uh, two rows. You can see this is a kind of thermal design to make sure that the latter row has no thermal problems. Yeah. And the move, move later, so in the, in, in, by the end of the, uh, 17, uh, 2017, we also work together with uh, Lavadia yeah, to adopt the, to the, the, the first uh, liquid cooling systems that can help achieve the best cooling efficiencies. And then in the, our third generation uh, launched uh, by the end of, uh, Last year, yeah, we we can support 16 uh, accelerators in uh, uh, eight U chassis box. So at this time, we, we try to build the system in a modular way so that it can it can um, support different uh, uh, accelerator modules. So this can help to build an ecosystems. So yeah, how we uh, for our second generation we uh, use the liquid coolings. Yeah, so our our architecture actually can support both the uh, traditional air cooling, yeah, we have the shared fan wall, yeah, at the rear of the, the rack, and also we, we can support the liquid cooling. You, we see that we have a manifold on the rear of the, ch on the, the, on the rack, and we use the cool plate, yeah. So this system um, help to have the better effic power, uh, thermal efficiencies. Now come to our first generation. This is also our OI compatible systems. So. Of course, it also support liquid cooling. So we combine these uh, two, ben two benefit two features together. So it's a kind of a modular modular way that can support different accelerators, but also achieve the uh, best cooling efficiencies. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, uh, our view. Yeah. We, this uh, we have a, a HIB board and the uh, universal base board and the integrated fan and as other cold plates, the thermal uh, cooling related com components. This is the overview of the system overview. Yeah. 
So basically, it's a, uh, from the chassis system, it's, a, it's a quite similar like the, the previous shared three OI reference system. It's the difference that this system is the first of liquid cooling reference systems. Yeah. Here we have uh, the, this is the, this is the init. Yeah, this blue is, this is the init. And the red one is the outlet. So the cold water, and the cold water, and the, the hot water out. So we have the, <coughs> the, the, the water lookout to find out uh, to several, several, several parts. Yeah, we have the, it's the beam to hold the, another uh, in aggregator, right, to make sure the system is okay. Yeah. Okay, so th that is, uh, it is a uh, uh, liquid cooling part. So for these systems, actually, the HIB interface board still have uh, uh, other components. So that is not liquid cooling yet. So from a system design perspe perspective, we still need the fan here, yeah. So this system actually is a hybrid solutions. So uh, we remove the liquid cold, the cold plate part and use the protein heat sink. So the, the fan is, is working okay, yeah. But for, but for the liquid cooling solution, we still need to do the, the fan there. Just that the fan speed here is lower, yeah. Okay, this is the, the front. Uh, this is the, the front view. We have the uh, HIB interface board, several uh, expansion slots, and this, uh, yeah, this is the rear view. So this is the, um, we, we, we need to consider how we can ser solve the thermal challenge in here because the, actually the QSBDD here is in the real side. So it will have impact on the single integrity of the, for example, the QSB, QSBDD cables. So, so that is the, is the challenge we also need to resolve. Yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, heat requirements. We, we can see that actually when you use uh, uh, liquid cooling, so, um, Generally, it's, it's, uh, the, heat, the heat requirement is uh, less than the heat sink because uh, actually the heat sink uh, is quite high. So basically, uh, we can control the, the heat requirement under uh, three units. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, the uh, OM, from OM module perspective, how we uh, there is indeed uh, thermal challenges, right? So um, this is uh, for example the the height and the, the, the width of the oil modules. The, this is uh, the screwing holes to, uh, inc to fix the, the modules onto the UBB board. And we see some, uh, uh, some thermal related challenges. Uh, so for example, on, on the right side, yeah, uh, some, some modules may have uh, some components that is, um, you know, have, have, have interface, yeah, for example, here. So this will, have some impact on a common design code plate. Yeah, also this is a three part. Yeah, so this is, um, uh, this is not uh, good for kind of standardization. So we, we later we'll share how we can solve this kind of uh, problems. Yeah. And here this is an example code plate design. So basically, um, yeah, here the, the screwing hole, yeah, because uh, this should be exactly made the OEM module itself, yeah. So, and uh, on, on the right side, we can see that. So, how the uh, how the, the pipe yeah, go in and go out from the, through the cold plate. So, we need to avoid this this kind of uh, horizontal design method because uh, that pipe can have a mechanical interface. For example, the the, the previous uh, yeah. I, I, if the if the pipe is horizontal, then it will have interface with uh, some other components on the OM modules, yeah. Okay, so this is, a, the, this is the OM module, and this is the code plate. So these screwing holes should be match each other exactly the same. So, but different modules may have a different screwing hole positions. So that also yeah, is, uh, brings some problems for the, this kind of standardization. Okay, so for our current, current design, we, we use this way. So the, the init and outlet is vertical to the code plate, and the, the head should be awarded this kind of other mechanical interference. Yeah. Okay, the, this is how the system uh, pipe routing, yeah, the, uh, all the code plate and the cabling, yeah, and made on the universal baseboard. Yeah. And we, we, yes, also some other options we don't use. Yeah, so for example, you can see the, the init, yeah. 
In this way, the, the unit and audit is a lot identical, so that will bring a manufacturing, I mean, problem for, for the code plate. And for other parts, we can see that a lot of mechanical interference. So, yeah, so even though we are, now we already have a one reference system, liquid cooling reference system, but we do see some problems. If we want to uh, design a generic way that can support most uh, uh, OE modules, so we, we need to kind of standard. Yeah. So for the liquid cooling, yeah, it's uh, uh, the OE module and the plus top stifler. So this kind of part is provided by uh, OM partners, and we can have another code plate. So this co these two components together compose the solutions. So for these solutions. For each different OEM modules, we need to design another code plate to match the position requirement and other coding um, mis component uh, mechanical related, related requirement. And also, we have a different kind of bow management because we different modules has a different code plate, right? And uh, so, and also for this kind of solutions, we some components may not be cooled very well with the liquid coolings because uh, Basically, there's no head thing, right? So, the, on the, the code plate only uh, has some uh, interface connected with uh, the modules. So maybe, and other components are not cooled very well. And for air cooling, yeah, currently uh, the the OM, OM specification provide the uh, uh, reference designs, and uh, so the OM module and plus the uh, top stifler and the uh, reference head thing. So these three together actually are provided by the OM partners for as a single single product. So it might be easier for the uh, for the bone management, but uh, if we want to share the same the same system design, so in this case the top stifler of the liquid cooling <coughs> and the, also the air cooling is different. So how we so we work with the uh, Facebook to try to uh, standardize this kind of designs to make sure. Yeah, the system can be support can support both air cooling and the liquid cooling by a standardized uh, stand standardized top top stifler. So, uh, hopefully, we'll help you share this. Yeah. Richard, sorry, I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that it's a hybrid cooling scheme. So you have some parts that are cold plate, you know, the accelerator modules, but some parts still require fans uh, for you know, uh, traditional. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that they weren't. Yet. Is, there, is there a plan to do full liquid cooling, or we always have some? Okay, so uh, yeah, at the HIB interface board yeah, here, we, we can see that maybe this picture. Yeah, so for for the for the OEM modules, right? We can we can design a specific uh, code plate that helps the helps the uh, the cooling of the OEM modules uh, because actually that is the key component in the system, right? So it, it has kind of thermal challenges if you want to. Uh, support up to, for example, 500 watts. But for this kind of traditional components, basically this is the PCI switch and the BMC for this part. Uh, yes, technically we can also uh, design another kind of code plate, right, the, on the on the PCI switch and BMC. But uh, uh, that will make the system very complex. So maybe it's not quite deserve that. And uh, because you see that in this chassis, actually, we can have a several integrated uh, fans. So just that the fan speed here is, uh, is, is, is lower than the traditional air cooling environment. So from system design uh, consideration, so we, we don't need to have a full liquid cooling uh, system. Yeah. So can you go to the pro next slide? I think it's a profile. Mm -hmm. Or next, next to the, yeah. yeah. So, but obviously, if you got rid of those fans or made smaller fans, you could make a shorter chassis, right? Because it looks like fans are driving the height of that chassis. Oh, you mean this one? Yeah, the. The okay. fans are driving the height of the chassis. So. Okay. Okay. If you didn't have the fans, or you had smaller fans, you could make mm -hmm. a shorter chassis. Okay, you mean the the, the height, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the the, the height of the, uh, the this chassis is is not. Uh, I mean. Uh, because the power consumption of this chassis is, is, is even 3,000 3, or 5,000 watts, right? So basically, for one rack, you can support, uh, for example, four, maybe already the maximum numbers, right? So the height of the rack actually is not a problem. You have enough space. So we don't need to uh, limit the height of this chassis. That doesn't bring extra values. 
yeah, if we want to minimize the head, we, for example, you said we can use a smaller fan here, but maybe the, the efficiency of the fan here is not the best. So, and also we have some other, for example, the high, uh, the, the uh, PCIe card here. So maybe it's, in, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's possible to keep it just three units, but not too much, right? So that doesn't help too much. Yeah. And also actually this system is, is designed to support both air cooling and liquid coolings. So we, we, we don't want to design a special fan here just for the liquid cooling solutions. Thanks, Richard. So Richard kind of went over some of um, like a reference system design for um, for the OEMs, and he highlighted some of the thermal challenges related to um, enabling liquid cooling for the OEMs. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how that impacts um, what we're going to do in terms of standardization and how that affects the OAM specification. So back in March at the Global Summit, we um, released uh, an initial version of the OAM specification. And in that, um, we talked about the top stiffener and how there were not really any particular requirements for the top stiffener other than having holes available for the mounting screws, which are mounting the OAM module to the baseboard. Um, there were no requirements as to size and location of the heat sink holes. And um, going forward, if we're going to be looking at liquid cooling, um, that's something that we're going to have to consider, is to um, standardize those, the size and the hole locations um, for that mounting. Um, and the reason for that, as Richard highlighted, was the, um, your cold plate and your tube loops tend to stay with your system versus with an with air-cooled heat sink solution your heat sink and your um, OAM is your fru. Um, so our goal is to, one, standardize those hole locations and then also find some sort of standard interface um, for the liquid cooled solution to the OAM. Um, once we find some sort of solution that we can standardize on, we would um, the OAI group would also provide reference designs so that um, we, that would pr mean that the OAM vendors would only have to have minimal redesign. Um, as of right now, our cooling target for, uh, for liquid cooling is 550 watts, um, and that assumes a single die OAM. So I'm going to go through a, f uh, a few different proposals, um, but all of those assume single die. And then also the next few slides are really, really dense. Um, we will be releasing these slides online. So I think we would encourage you to take a look at those and help give us feedback later. So um, the first solution or proposal that we have is um, what we're going to call option A1. And basically, this, um, this tries to find a standard top surface of the top stiffener of the OAM so that you, the bottom side of your cold plate could be uh, a standard. And then you could have a cold plate that's shared between different OAMs. Um, and in order to do this, what we would do is grow the top stiffener above the tallest component. So some of the, uh, the pros of this approach is that you have a standard cold plate. So when you're swapping out an, an OAM in the field, like in a data center, um, all you would have to do is change out or retrofit your TIM or your thermal interface material, um, and you wouldn't have to change out your cold plate. Uh, the disadvantage of this approach is that um, some of the components, the side components or miscellaneous components that are next to the die, um, some of them may be particularly tall. And in order to deal with that, your top stiffener would have to grow a lot, and that would uh, cause less than optimal cooling for those components. So in order to help alleviate that, we have um, option A2, which is very similar. But now instead of having a top stiffener that is purely a structural material, you'd have maybe multiple parts or multiple materials, um, one which has a structural component and another that has more of a, uh, like more of a thermally conductive material um, that um, might help with better cooling to the, the side components. So the pros of this approach is that you, 
you improve the cooling for your components on the side, um, and you help better protect your package. But the problems with this approach is that now you have a more complicated design and a possibly um, more difficult manufacturing process. And the, the third approach that we came up with is option B, which is quite different than A1 and A2, um, because that means that we, you would have a, a semi-custom cold plate. And so uh, if you have a semi-custom cold plate, then you can adjust the wings of the cold plate to um, accommodate uh, different heights of components on the sides of your OEM. And that would improve, like opt optimize the cooling to those components. Um, because now your cold plate is different for each OEM anyway, um, you could go another step further and you could also possibly have different mounting holes or different um, package sizes. So pros of this approach, um, more flexibility um, and um, possibly optimized cooling and disadvantages. Now you have a mu much more difficulty in the data center in terms of your service model where now when you're swapping out an OAM, you also have to swap out your cold plate as well. Um, and as Richard mentioned that you would also have some issues with bomb management and more complexity there. Um, if we take a step back, uh, this is kind of our approach to um, standardization for liquid cooling at the chassis level. Um, right now we're focusing on standardizing for the cold plate and um, we can also standardize for the tube loops because now we have a universal baseboard or UBB. And so since on the UBB, those eight OAM modules are in fixed locations, we can have those, the, the standardized tube loops. Um, the other areas that you could possibly look at are the rack to chassis interface, um, your quick disconnects as well as your coolant. But right now what we're saying is those are going to be platform dependent um, and out of scope for standardization. But we definitely welcome alternate proposals and feedback on that. Um, so uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll share with a mailing list and um, wiki. So feel free to give us feedback. Um, and now I'm gonna hand it over to Tianyi and he's gonna talk about liquid cooling at the um, rack and data center level. Thank you. Uh, I'll be uh, talking about the right level configuration design and the data center facility for the liquid cooling. So this slide uh, uh, shows uh, some highlights, uh, key innovations on the Baidu uh, new RAC V3. So this is a high level uh, compatible design. We have, uh, it's a 21 inch RAC, but it's compatible for 21 inch and 19 inch IT equipment to be populated. It can be used as a bus bar solution for power system and also can be used as a conventional uh, P PDU solution. And the fans uh, is integrated on the server side and a rack manifold. A rack manifold can be integrated on the rear side of the rack. So the rack is ready for both air cooling solution and liquid cooling solution. You can see this is a highly compatible for different use cases, rack level design. So on the data center side, either for air cooling system or liquid cooling system, so we see the key challenge is really the huge dynamic power variations. What's well, due to many factors, right? The variety of IT equipment, hardware platforms, right configurations that deployed and to be deployed under the plan, the uh, different business requirements from internal and external, and also dynamic variations of the operating conditions and uh, you know workloads. <clears throat> on the thermal side, there was multiple cooling solutions, cooling methods, and products. But when you come to actual use case, your own use scenarios, it's completely new design. So it's really a challenging that to design the data center, operate the data center cooling system to ensure that to meet the thermal requirements under those dynamic variations in high efficiency, high quality, and uh, high reliability in scale, and also in the lifetime of the cooling system. And uh, we also <laughs> have to keep in mind that at the end of the day, the cost is a major factor. Right? So Baidu, we continue innovating and improving our cooling infrastructures. Here is Charles, so a major uh, cooling system we have deployed in our system. So this one I want to highlight is OCU solution. We have the heat changer 
uh, located on the top of the rack. So we had already deployed the liquid loops, water loops in the data center very close to the rack. <coughs> for the, uh, for in this application, uh, for the liquid cooling system design, it's not just a pure liquid cooling infrastructure. It's a co-design or co-existing design of a liquid cooling system and air cooling system in the same data center IT room and the, and the data center building. So <coughs> the system loop or thermal loop requires an end-to-end -end solution from the liquid cooling uh, electronic to the ambient. So because uh, like gentleman just mentioned, uh, so the IT equipment needs cooling water and also cooling air at this, at this version. So <coughs> the uh, this chart, again, the economical factor is always the key. So this chart shows, you know, is simplified a sigmatic representation of a cooling infrastructure for a liquid cooling loop and the air cooling loop. So it's a two independent loop, right? The liquid cooling loop, you can see using a CDU as a this coolant distribution unit forming a two thermal transfer loop in secondary loop and the primary loop. So in some of the use cases, in some scenarios, these two loops the liquid cooling infrastructure and the air cooling infrastructure can be coupled. So this one I see a possible solution. You, you can see that uh, the liquid cooling infrastructure and the air cooling infrastructure are coupled on the secondary system of the uh, uh, cooling system. You can see the cooling water or cooling liquid supply by the CDU is go to a liquid cooling equipment and the liquid to air heat exchanger is for cooling the air parallelly. Or it can be working in series. The water supply, the bad CDU goes to the liquid to air heat exchanger, gets warmed up, then goes to the liquid cooled equipment and re return back to the you know, secondary loop. So this one, as that gentleman mentioned, that can be considered as a pure liquid cooled rack, right? But you have the liquid to air heat exchanger very close to the rack, high density solution. But this two loop can be decoupled from the secondary system. You can see this one. You have two independent secondary loop for the liquid cooling infrastructure and air cooling infrastructure. But those two loop or two infrastructure share the same primary loop, or it can be separate. For example, you can see these two systems can be parallelly or can be in series. So in series, you have the facility water supply to liquid to air heat exchanger gets warmed up, goes to the primary loop of the CDU, cools the secondary loop of the CDU then goes back to the primary system. Or it can be parallelly operated. So this one goes to the facility loop. So we, Baidu, has deployed multiple uh, systems in our data centers. This one shows the liquid cooled rack rear view, front view. That one is an external cooling unit dedicated for liquid cooling solution that room fluid distribution. So I want to say that uh, <coughs> since the time is up. So a really good solution requires a thorough end-to-end -end design, including the IT and our infrastructure, and a very good use case and application scenario, and also require a healthy and uh, um, mature ecosystem. So with that, I would like to invite you to visit the Baidu X-Men 4.0 demo booth, and also provide feedback to our OAI liquid uh, standardization. So with that, I will take questions and uh, thank you for your attention. Those two links, you can do the uh, project, you can access the project wiki, get the latest updation, and also register, do the registration for the mailing list. Thank you. <laughs>